So welcome everyone to this evening's webinar using small side games to promote engagement and maximize learning. I see a lot of familiar faces in the in the chat function. Welcome back. Uh, it's great to see you. A lot of stuff that I'm covering tonight, you probably would have seen before, probably a few new ideas as well. But I suppose what we're trying to do is, I suppose, look at that really, that, that how do we promote that engagement and maximize learning for our players, um, utilizing small sided games. Um, so I'll try and keep it as simplistic as I can uh, during the webinar and hopefully you can take something from the evening. So what is it I'm trying to achieve is that understand the key coaching skills, I suppose, and list those coaching skills and continue to remind ourselves about them, but also learn about coaching strategies that would develop players via games. And, and I know a lot of you may have heard of teaching games for understanding. I know I have a few people here who are on the call tonight who are involved with our Gated for Teens program. We've probably seen a lot of this stuff as well. But it's really what kind of practices and strategies can we implement in our sessions that would help maximize that learning and engagement of our players? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to achieve at all times. So I will start by saying this. The fundamental to improving player engagement and maximizing learning is the application of the key coaching skills. So whether you are uh, involved at uh, underage level, whether you're involved at adult level, whether you're involved at uh, player development level, whether you're involved at inter-county level, the application of the key coaching skills is a fundamental stepping stone to player engagement and maximizing learning. The games and the activities that you do will support that but the application of the key uh, coaching skills are, are, are important. And I always go through these. So how well you introduce. I, I'm William, welcome to today's session. Today we're gonna to focus on kick passing. Today we're gonna to focus on X, Y, and Z. The power of demonstrations, how well we demonstrate. And if we can't demonstrate, someone else can demonstrate for us, whether it be a player, uh, or we might use a, a video or whatever it may be. How we explain, can we get to the point? You know, can we use head, hands, feet when we're doing a specific skill? Uh, or if we're explaining a game, how can we explain it in a way that the players are active as much as possible during the session? So that's session, that's part four, that active action. Players are active for the majority of the session. That's key. And then as coaches, well, how well are we looking, observing? How well are we coaching what we see, if that makes sense? Okay, so that looking, observing is vitally important. So I'm just kind of setting the scene before I go in and show you a few games and that session uh, outline. But it's vitally important that the application of these key coaching skills is fundamental to whatever you do from an activity point of view in your sessions. So how well you introduce, how well you demo, how active are players in your sessions, how well do you stand back, observe and look, how well do you spot and fix, how well do you go through the breakdown of the key coaching skills. But then we go through the, you know, in terms of if we want to modify uh, an activity, if we want to challenge our players, I mean, the stepper model is the way to go. Very simple. A lot of people come and ask, William, give me loads of games. And tonight I'll show you a few games, 100%. But that's only one aspect. That's the what of coaching. The how of coaching is powerful. We need to know why girls are coming in the gate, which is the why, okay, and who we are coaching, which is they're very much depending on if they're underage, whether they're adults, whether they're inter-county, whether they're player development program, what stage of development that they're at. But the how of coaching is, is, is the key, is the, is the key to, I suppose, engaging and maximizing our players and maximizing learning uh, and engagement uh, with our players. So change the space, smaller, bigger, you know, time. We're going to do this for 30 seconds. You know, we're going to do it for three minutes. Change the dynamic and the intensity of an activity. Equipment, less or more footballs. Players, less or more players. And then rules in terms of, well, what rules will we apply if we want to achieve certain items in our session? So the point I'm trying to make here is, before we go into the activities and show you a session plan, it's vitally important we have clarity in our mind, okay? What does this look like in terms of coaching skills? The how to coach skills? Because you have the best games in the world, but if you don't apply the basics of coaching, then you're missing a trick there. Now, you can agree or disagree with me in the chat function. Please share your thoughts. But I just think it's vitally important that uh, we as coaches don't lose sight about the, the basics of coaching. Do the basics really well, everything else will fall into play. So I advocate ideal principle 
stepper model. Anywhere I go, I advocate those two principles and they stay true to myself as a coach. And I'd like to advocate that as well. Okay. So we move it on. Again, before we go into the the game-based approach or you know, using small side games, we need to keep in our mind why our players are coming in the gate. They want to be different, fun. They want to do it with their friends. But the big one is they want to improve and develop. So how do we have evidence in every session that players are improving, developing? How do we know from game to game that they're improving and developing? We need to train our coaching eye to be able to see and to see in front of us if players are improving or not. We need to have that evidence. And the use of small-sided games will really help you with that. Okay? Um, and I'll go through one or two models that might help you with that. Keep things fun and interesting. The more girls are in touch with the ball, the more in fun and interesting it's going to be. Okay? The more, And the only way they can touch the ball a lot more is by being in an environment whereby they're being promoted with that in terms of uh, small side activities. But I suppose it's just for yourselves in your mind, well, why are girls coming in the gate? Why are my players coming in the gate? They want to improve and develop. They want to improve and develop. They want to be obviously enjoy what they're doing, but they want you as a coach to make it interesting for them, to make it fun for them so they can enjoy the learning and maximize their engagement and participation and also in learning in their, in their part. So again, we did a study or a, a webinar on this recently. So I'm not going to go into it in detail. You can look back in more detail over the, the coming days in, on, on our LGFA YouTube channel. But the current engagement and the learning environment, what is it looking like at this present time in an LGFA environment? So our Learn to Lead program, we videoed, uh, you know, we did coach analysis with coaches over 20 sessions, 25 sessions. And we just observed, well, what are we as coaches doing currently in a female environment, in an LJFA environment, in a ladies football environment? And what we're noticing at the moment is that 60% of the time, we as coaches are instructing, we're telling, we're explaining. And 8% of the time is use of questioning. So I want you in your mind to picture what that session could look like. So that's where the coach is doing it, all the, the direction and being very authoritarian in terms of how they're going to conduct the session. And the players are just basically going through the motions, activity, activity, being told what to do, where to go, how to do it. Off you go. I'll give you feedback. I'll let you know how to do it better or improve it. And that's really what we're seeing. So a lot of instruction going on, less questioning. Therefore, the engagement of the players in terms of their own thought process and problem solving it's less. So think about that session for now. Think about you and your own coach at this, at this present time. Where do you fit in terms of your coaching? And hopefully tonight will inform that you're doing great work or do you know what? There's something there I can work on over the coming weeks. The other slide I'd like to take in from that webinar is this one here. And it's probably pertinent to tonight is, you know, what are the, the, the main states in terms of time of an average coaching session in ladies football. This is over 20 odd sessions now. Video work, coaching analysis with performer sports, over 20 odd sessions, observing coaching analysis, observing what is it we are, how we go about our business in terms of coaching, but also the what we're doing. And as you see here, 22% of the time, the players are inactive. So let's go back to the title of the webinar in terms of, I suppose, promoting engagement and maximizing learning. Then if our players are 22% of the time inactive, and that what I mean by inactive is they're actually, you know, they're just either having a drink of water or they're standing around. There's no, shall I say, discussion or dialogue even going on in, between the coach and the players. It's just the players are probably just 22% of the time are either just standing around, maybe having a drink of water, whatever it may be. And again, think about that and think about your own sessions and think about where does that fit in to where you are currently. And let's go back to the key coaching principles about keeping players active for the majority of the time. So it's just something to observe. But the other thing I observed here was if we want to maximize learning and promote engagement, then we're promoting the concept of small sided games. Yes, over the course of all those sessions, 8% of the session is small sided games. No. Not saying that you know there's any right or wrong, but we're probably saying that that non-active phase has to come down, and maybe the small-sided gain phase needs to increase. But 
we seem to be playing a lot of, uh, should I say, larger games in our sessions. So 20, 20% of the time is we're playing a full game or maybe maybe 11 v 11 or 12 v 12, whatever numbers you have. So we're, we're kind of advocating, look at that in your own session. Well, how does your session break down currently? Is it traditional in nature? So you go from the warm-up to skill drills to uh, you know shooting drills to maybe a small side game to a game. Or do you look at probably mixing match and looking at, okay, I'll play more games. So I might do a warm-up and I play a game. Okay, so think about that and just think about your own coaching currently. And where, where do you, if you were to get someone to video your session, where would you fit in here? You know, in terms of the activities you do. So think about that. So what are the benefits of small side games? And we're probably very much aware what are the benefits. But look, we'll go through them again before we move on to the sample session. So guys, if you look at here, you have more touches of the ball, 100%. If you have 4v4, 1v1, 2v2, 3v3s, 4v4, 5v5, obviously more touches of the ball. The only way a player can develop and improve is by touching the ball as many times as possible in a session. So if I'm doing a session and I have 30 players, I'll have 30 footballs. If I have to beg and borrow, I'll do that. No problem at all, because I feel it's vitally important. Improve decision making and any tactical plays. You might play a small side game where you're working on moving into space. You might play a small side game where you're looking to release the ball fast into the full forward. And you might play a small side game whereby you're, you know, you know when to use the hand pass, when you use the kick pass. Uh, so there's various, I suppose, things you can develop through small side games. And it's always developing, you know, that, that decision making. Physical efficiency. So now, obviously, if there's a larger space and there's less numbers, just a lot of running going on there. You might be working on small, uh, sh uh, should I say, change of direction or maybe anaerobic uh, uh, materials. So therefore, you'd be smaller spaces with less numbers. So therefore, there's a different dynamic. So you're working on that physical efficiency. Involvement in the game. Okay, if you're 3v3 or 4v4, you have more players involved. They're, they're going to be on the ball more times than not. But... If you have a larger game with 11 v 11, 12 v 12, then how many times are they involved in the players? How many times are all players involved in the games all of the time? I suppose increased exposure to attacking and defending solutions, score goals and points. There's that freedom of expression as well. And that's the one thing I really like about small side games. And I do an awful lot of small side games in my own sessions because there's a freedom of expression as well. You want players to have a small bit of creativity as well. So therefore, these small side games are really, really beneficial. But the big one for me would be, and I'm going back to the key coaching skills, is that small-sided games allows you to give individual feedback to a player or maybe work in a group setting with your players in terms of feedback and meaningful feedback. And I think that's that's probably one of the major benefits that I would have from a small-sided games point of view. It gives me more time to engage with players, to give them meaningful feedback one-to-one -one, or maybe as a smaller group so to me, that's probably one of the biggest benefits. Guys, chat function. Let me know. Agree, disagree, thoughts, any questions. Put them into chat function. I'll do my best to answer as I go along. Okay. So anybody who's involved in the Gator Routines probably have, very, have seen this before. And I'll show you the videos of the game now as well. So you've got to have a clarity in, your, in what you're looking for. So, you know, if, when you're introducing today, everyone, we're going to work on whatever it may be, go kick passing, movement of players, communication. But you have to have clarity in your mind what it is you're looking for. Because when you have clarity in your mind what you're looking for, then you can apply the appropriate activities. So that's very key. And in my sessions, I would have, I'd have a lot of small sided games, but they'd be very similar in nature. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. Possible challenge or solutions. You have to think about, well, what is it I might see here? Yes, you might have players of various ability levels. So therefore, that could be something that you may have to be observant of and think of a possible solution. You may have players who probably their movement isn't where it should be. So therefore, you might think of something that you need to do to improve that. Uh, or even maybe the communication, which is one thing that, let's be honest about, in a lot of female sports and in, in underage girls, uh, is that communication process where they talk and interact with each other on a regular basis. So... The point I'm making here is you need to have clarity in your mind and what you're looking for. So therefore, you can apply the appropriate games. But then also, it's vitally important that you have an idea of what is it you might see. And therefore, then you'll be able to adapt better as a result. Kina, I suppose 
there's no right or wrong, but I'd definitely be more than eight percent. Like on a, on, a, on a normal night, geez, I'd be up to thirty, maybe forty percent of the session would be small side games. You know, because you'd have your warm up, you'd have your maybe ball from familiarization. You might be doing patterns, you might be doing skill activities. But then it's all games after that. So I would possibly play two. Two probably small side games a night, but I'll show you now how I do it. So I might be only do one or two, but I'll show you how I progress it on. So it would take up 30, 35% of my session anyway, if not more, um, uh, Kleena. Do you know, but 8%, um, do you know the, the percentage we saw there earlier on, which was, I think it was, here we have it, you know, 8% is too low. It's too low in terms of what we're trying to achieve. If you're really serious about developing players. Hi, Tomas, how are you? So you, you mentioned there, Tomas, around what is your opinion um, on allocating specific time for drills, games, etc., to get the most out of the train session? I suppose, Tomas, there's, there's no set, should I say, time. It's what is it you're looking for, Tomas, and what do you need to do to achieve your outcome? We'll determine that, Tomas, if, if that makes sense. So it all depends on what you're focusing on in any given night will determine how much time you give to something. And I'll show you a structure now in a minute that something I would advocate an awful lot and I would do it myself. Um, so it might help answer that question. Um, I hope it does. Anyway. So how do you manage large numbers of players, for example, 30, with only two coaches to run a small side games? First of all, and I think, I suppose I would probably, if you want to really be, if the club, are really support as uh, serious in supporting you uh, in developing players. Then the ideal scenario for developing players in terms of ratio from players to coaches is one to eight. One to eight. One to ten, I, I get away with. So if you have 20 players, you should have two coaches. You know, one to 12 would be maximum. So I'd be thinking, and you need to have three coaches with you. Um, but I'll show you in a minute, and how you could probably work with 30 players with two coaches. So if you bear with me on that one, I'll do my best to answer that. And how what I would do, and, I, and I'll, show, I'll share a few ideas on that end. So hopefully I'll, I'll answer that by the... What age group? Oh, geez, you can, ask, you can, you can play small side games with anybody, uh, any age group. Like a 1v1 to me is, is a small side game. And I know that might sound very strange. And I know I did a webinar re uh, previously where I showed a visual of where I went from 1v1, Sean, up to 4v4, up to 8v8 in one activity. So I would be promoting small side games really as, as early as possible because, again, the concept is applied. It's, the only difference is the stage of development of the players. So therefore, the rules you apply, the size of the activity uh, – would only be different. Like, for example, with under sixes, they might be throwing the ball. Obviously, with under 15s, or the hand passing the ball. So I would say really as early as possible. And you, if you're with the underage, then you're going to be doing a lot of station work. So one of your stations should be a small side of game. Definitely should be a small side of game. Okay. Um, and I would advocate even stronger for younger age groups in terms of developing of, of their players. So I hope that helps there. Um Covers restarts and kickouts. So, Stephen, I actually did a webinar, um, you know, on that topic recently. It's on the LGFA YouTube channel, and it's about our own patterns of play. Um, but I like your idea, Stephen, and it's actually an awful lot. I actually started doing that recently, whereby if I'm playing a small side game, I'd probably start with a restart from the goalkeeper, or it might be a kick into the full back, and we started from there. So. Yeah, I definitely think even from a sideline ball, 100%. Yeah, and I, I would explore that and be creative in that. I, I actually got into that space a small bit, Stephen, whereby I'm utilizing game-based scenarios in my small side games. So I might start it from a kick out. I might start it from a, you know, the ball kicked into the, from, from the half back line and I kick it to the half back line and start from there. I might start from a sideline ball. So yeah, 100%. Be as creative as you want. But we've done a webinar on patterns of play which would be very, very specific to that as well. So you might get a bit of uh, further information on that as well there. But yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I do. And, and let me know what you think. It's, it's on the Patterns of Play one, Stephen. It's on the LGFA YouTube channel. Yeah, give a look at that. It's something that has really gone into my own coaching at the moment. But yeah, I agree with you. Small side games that mimic or maybe can be as close to the game scenario as possible. Oh, yeah, I strongly promote that. Okay, um, good, please, come on, that's great. Come into the chat function, come on, share your thoughts, because I might cover everything. So the more people that ask questions, the more I'd make sure I try and answer them. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you the game now in a minute. But think about this. So think about the game. This is a small sided game. Now, if I was doing this coaching session again, I'd do totally different. Okay, and I'll show you, I'll tell you why in a minute. But when you're introducing the game at the start, you just give the rules of the game. Okay, just give the rules of the game. The object of the game is two teams. There's a circle around the goal. In order to get a score, you must score from outside the circle over the bar. You probably all know it. It's called the central goal game. But all I would do is, is I just give the rules of the game. That's all. And I do that in 30, 40 seconds. Now, the point here I'm making is not every player will understand it. I guarantee you, it could be absolutely chaos for the first for the first goal. But get the game going. Get the game. Someone will have picked it up. Obviously, your demonstration will obviously help as well. So demonstrate what you need to do. But get them going as fast as possible. So what you're doing here is that you're giving the rules of the game, let them play, and then you're looking and observing. So any small-sided games that you're playing, it's vitally important just give them the rules, let them at it. Let them dis discover it themselves, let them play, let them make mistakes, let it be chaos, okay? And, and just observe what you see because that's very important. You need to observe what you see. That'll determine your next step. But if you don't observe or step in and stop it all the time, then you're, you're stifling that creativity, number one. But number two, you're not letting them explore or you know, get a feel for the game. So the first thing I would say to you, any small side of games you're doing, all you need to give the players is the rules of the game. That's all. And let them play. So go back to your ideal principle. Guys, we're playing the uh, central goal game. Here's a demonstration. These are the key points you need to do to an hour to score. Off you go. And then you're looking observing. So I'll show you the game here. And you can let me know the chat function if you can see it. So I'll just let it play again, guys. Okay, everyone. So I'm going to leave this pause for a second. Uh, Mark, you asked a very good question. Should you send the session to your panel beforehand? You know, I've never actually tried that. Try it and let me know what you think. And I suppose really the state of development of your players would be important here. Maybe the older group or the group that can probably take that information in. I've never actually tried where I send the session to them. Yeah, something I try. <laughs> and if you do try, please let me know you get on. But here we have a small side of game. Now, let's go back to the point made earlier on by Anne in terms of numbers. If I was to do this game again, there's too many players there. So at the moment, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven aside. So, okay, if I was to do that again, I would set up two uh, goals with uh, two circles around, and I'd play four aside, three aside. Okay, or I might play four aside on either side. So I'd make it smaller again. I'd probably feel there's too many players there. But what else I could do is I could add another ball. I could have two balls going. Okay, but all I'm doing here is I'm letting them play. So the coaches on the outside observing the game and watching the game and letting them play. So the point I'm making here is just introduce the rules. This is how you play the game and let them play the game. So there's an example of a small side game. You probably have all seen it before. Okay, but that's just an example of the game. Okay, so let them play and let them explore. Let's watch it again. And what you see here, everyone, is that, you know, a uh, player just observe who's getting on the ball, observe what their movement is like. And what you notice with these sort of games is that their movement will be very static at the start. The teams will probably stay on both sides. Now, they're very good in this where the girls are going on bo both sides. But you need to look at what is it I could see in this game, okay? And this game, what I'm trying to do is movement. I'm really trying to get them to kick the ball a lot as well. So I'm promoting kicking. So, and always at the score. So just give a look at it. Watch what's going on. Observe who's involved, who's not involved. Okay. So we've done the game. Then we have to look at, okay, what is it? What is happening here? And this is what I'm talking about here in terms of maximizing learning and engagement. So, and this will answer your question in a minute, Anne. 
What I would do here is I have my questions planned. So I'd bring the two teams in, okay? And I'd pose questions to them like, tell me, what is it we're trying to achieve here? Can you describe to me, you know, what are you experiencing playing the game? Um, next time we were going to play this game, what do you think we can do to improve it? In order to achieve our aim, which is a score point, how is important, you know, what, how, what, what's the best way we can, you know, what needs to happen in order to give us that opportunity? Okay, in your opinion, how many players need to support the ball? So what you're doing is you're asking really engaging questions to check for understanding and getting the players to explore and guide discovery and give you feedback. Now, there's a few ways you can do this. You can get the whole group in and you can ask the group. But the only thing I observe in particular with teenage players is that they probably don't like to speak in front of their peers. So you, again, you know your group and you know the stage of development of your group. So ask the questions. If they're a very quiet group, then what I would do is I'd move on to the next uh, idea is I'd put them into small groups. So I'd put, you know, groups of three and four, off you go, have a chat, discuss the game we just played, and tell me, you know, I'm going to ask you in 30 minutes, uh, in 30 seconds time, well, what can we do to improve? Tell me, okay? So I'd put them into small groups because they're more in, inclined to talk to each other than they are in talk in front of their group. There's another way I could try it is I could divide them into their teams. Team A, team B, have a chat about how can you improve as a team and what you're trying to do in order to improve the game? Now, going back to your point, Dan, if I had a large group and I was on my own, or I had two coaches, number one is if I had 30 players, I'd have 15 in one game, 15 in the other. That's 7v7, 8v8. Still a bit, bit large. So what I would do there is I wouldn't have two teams. I'd have three teams in each group. So I have 15 in one court and, and I have 15 in the other. I divide them into three teams then, three teams of five. So this is what I do. Same game as I play there. So I have two setups. I have one coach with one setup, one coach with the other setup. I have 15 players in each. And I divide the 15 uh, into three teams of five. Two teams play for one minute, one team observe. Rotate around. Every minute we rotate around. But what I would do is the team who's observing, I give them a task. Girls, I want you to look at the game. We're going to stop after one minute and you're going to give us feedback on what you see. Or let them all play once and then get feedback from uh, the teams that when they observe. So when a team goes out to observe, you're giving them from meaningful tasks. So, and I hope that helps. If you're doing small side games, I would say set up two areas. I'd say then divide them into three teams of five. You know, and therefore, then it's really meaningful in what you're doing. And that'll maximize the learning and engagement if you've only got two coaches. So I hope that answers that question. But it's vitally important we're aware of stage of development of our players. The smaller the number of the games, the 4v4, 5v5, 6v6, the better it is for learning. I'll just go into the chat function. Um, yeah, that game, yeah, it's a real good game. With that game that I just showed you, what you'll notice, you, you probably, you'll, be, you'll be very eager to step in because there'll be girls standing around talking to each other. There'll be others, you know, moving. There'll be others having a clue what's going on. But it's a really good game, so you need patience. But after a while, I'll show you how you can progress it on and develop it, okay? Um, maybe five, play yeah. But I would say for the first one, don't even go there, Kina. I'd say the rule is you got to score because observe what's happening. Because if one or two players are dominating, then I'll show you how you progress it on. But let it happen first. Let it happen. Do players stay on one side and once it goes over to the day five? That's the thing, Philip. What you notice is in that game is that they will stay on either side. But there's no rules to say they have to. They can go anywhere they want. But by the third session, which I'll show you in a few minutes, they'll be running over and back and everywhere because the learning they have through the interventions. It's the interventions are key here to get them to understand that. But you need to have patience to let this happen. It mightn't happen in the first session, everyone. It might take a few sessions for them to get a real understanding of it. So be patient as a coach as well. Okay. So now, we played the game. We did an intervention, or which was a group work, and we did it in various ways. Now I'm going to let them go back and play the game based on their feedback. So now, based on their feedback, we're going to improve. Because we, we've now identified what we need to do and improve. For example, only one person needs to go and support the ball. The other girls create space. 
For example, no one should be static. Everybody should be moving. For example, when you kick the ball over the bar, you need to go to the far side. Or what I could do is I could just change up the, the game by using the stepper model. So I might change. So if it's too difficult, or if, you know, I might increase the space. If it's you know, a bit easy, I might decrease the space. I might apply time. So I might, you know, in, to increase the intensity, I might say, come here to me. Instead of going for a minute, we'll do it for 30 seconds. So I want you all moving really well for 30 seconds. It's amazing how, you know, limiting the time, increasing or decreasing the time, you could change it. Equipment. I might even throw in two balls. I might even throw in three balls. So now there's a lot more going on. And a rule could be, in order to, you know, if you get a ball and you pass it, you've got to go and get another ball. So now we're really changing the dynamic of the game through our equipment. You can, oh, geez, there's too many players there. Like I said there, ah, oh, there's, what, there's 15 players there, 7v7. Okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to divide into three teams. It's going to be 5v5, one team resting and observing. I'll rotate here every 40 seconds. Okay? And then you could apply a rule. Like you said, Keenan, now, right, you have a certain amount of plays. You work off your non-dominant leg. So if there's players there at different stages of development, then I might say, come here, I'm going to challenge you by working you off your non-dominant leg while other players work off their dominant leg. So I hope this is helping you now how you use small side games to improve and develop players, but also involve the players in the learning. This is the key to it. Your questioning is vitally important and your organization. I would say a mixture of both. There's no right or wrong. There's a traditional approach of drills. The only thing I would say with drills, guys, is, you know, with drills, it's very kind of cone to cone. It's very linear. could be very static. Where with small side games, there's a lot more fluidity to it. Um, so I would say, obviously, I, I, I promote both. And I'll show you in a minute where a drill could be very beneficial, John. So bear with me. I'll show you where it can have to play a role as well. So I'm not saying right or wrong, you, oh, forget about drills. Yes, they play a role, 100%. But small side games gets players to probably, you know, just get an understanding of developing the skills in a game environment. And I think you learn a lot more from that. And obviously you have to isolate the skills at some stage, 100%. But uh, my advocation would be, you know, as, as more creativity as possible through small side games. Anna, this session's been recorded, so you'll get the recording afterwards. It's available on the LGFA YouTube channel. So give a look at your own time over the coming weeks and share it with your friends. And all the other web webinars, Anna, are there for you to view as well. So give a look at them. Um, yeah, I should try it out, Ellie. Sure, yeah. It is. It is a very beneficial game, and, and it can be used in so many ways. Okay, so, so we played the game. I gave them the rules. I've left them off. It could be chaotic. Let it happen. If you have big numbers, divide them into smaller groups. If you have two teams resting, play two te two, two players for 40, two teams for 30, 40 seconds. The next two teams come in, 40 seconds. Rotate it again. So it's nice and snappy. But if the girls are outside, they're observing, they have a task. You do an intervention. Get them, ask real good questions. Describe, tell me, you know, explain to me. Get girls problem solving, communicating, either as a full group or small groups, okay? In pairs even. And then we go back and we play the game again. But we change it slightly to the stepper model to make it more challenging based on the information we've got from the girls. Okay? Yeah, there is. There's actually on the YouTube channel as well, Tomas, there's actually a specific web on goalkeeping. And just so that you know, we have a, we had a goalkeeping workshop recently in Leinster. Um, we had one in Munster. We have one coming up in Connacht. We won't come up in Ulster in terms of goalkeeping. So very interesting. If you're in those areas, let me know. I'll let you know when those videos are on. But there's actually two webinars on goalkeeping specific on the LGFA YouTube channel, Tomas. Give a look at it when you get an opportunity under the coach education playlist. Okay. Right. Now, we played the game a second time. But I really want to work on kicking. I feel the kicking is not where it should be. So I'm going to do an intervention where we're going to practice kicking. I'll show you the video now in a minute. So that's how you set it up. And that's, you know, that's, oh, it's, we're working off dominant and non-dominant side. And I want you to tell me what you observe as well. So I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And I want you to tell me what do you observe, okay? So we'll play it on here and we'll show it. Here we go. So tell me, you know, what we observe here.
tell me what you see. Tell me what you see. So the game they're playing is where they have to score, kick the ball. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be a hook kick over the bar. Tell me what you see. What is you seeing here now? This is an intervention that's going to help us with the small side of the game. Okay? So I'll just play it one more time. So we're using both sides, left and right. What has every player got in their hand? What has every player got in their hand? And I suppose, Sean, when you're using the, the term, I, I think, guys, language we use, terminology we use is very important. So we're always working off our left side and our right side. We're always working off our dominant side, non-dominant side. I would try my best where possible to stay from weaker and stronger because now we're highlighting there is a difference. So when you're using your terminology and your language, use left or right, use dominant, non-dominant side, okay? But as you see here, guys, I have the non-dominant side or the left side close to the goals to increase the, um, shall I say, the, the opportunity to kick a point. Where the girls on the right side is a bit further out because the majority of them are right-legged, so therefore they're more dominant. But what I've done here is it gives me an opportunity to go through the head, hands, feet of the skills. What's my head doing? What's my hands doing? What's my feet doing? A lot of girls here probably never worked off their non-dominant side before. But sure, geez, if we don't practice it, then we can't improve it. And I'm going to show you where this comes into the game in a few seconds. So now we're progressing the game on. We're playing the same game. So we've gone from just off you go and play to an intervention to... Okay, we've changed the game a slightly with the rules or the, 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 the size of it or maybe the, the, the equipment. But now I really want to go after the kicking because that was one of my outcomes. So I want to go after the kicking. I'm going to actually practice kicking and let them practice kicking. Okay, but in order to do that, I need to have a ball per player. They're all working at their own level. They're not watching what the next person's doing. They're all going at their own time. If they score, they score. But we need to go after the coaching skills here. The head, hands, feet. So you're giving them meaningful feedback. You're working with them. They're working off left and right. And it's just a nice, so I suppose it goes back to the earlier point that drills and activities do have a role. Once there's a clear focus on what the role is, but look at them. Every player is active. Let's go back to the key coaching skills regarding the same. Okay. So now let's go back to the game. And I'll show you a few other games now in a minute. So now I'm going back to the game again. It's the same game though. It's the same small side of game. So remember you asked earlier on about time. So if you look at it there, we're playing this eight minutes. So that's three eight minutes. That's what, 24 minutes of the session. And I'm, I'm using small side games. But you might bring it down to six minutes. You might bring five minutes. That's up to you. You know what time you have. You know what you want to work on in your session. But I'm doing this for eight. That's 24 minutes of sessions I'm doing in, in small side games. 24 minutes. Okay. And the interventions didn't be another whatever. Five, six minutes. So that'll just give you an idea of the time frame we're talking about. That's nearly nearly 50% of the sessions on smart side games. But again, there's no definite in terms of time you use. You use it applicable to whatever you're trying to achieve. So we played the game. Now we're going to play the game again. But look at the difference now. The game has changed from the first game to the last game. Now, no hand passing uh, to place more emphasis on primary kicking. So I've cut out the hand passing. It's all kicking. It's all kicking. Now, again, bear in mind on the stage of your players. And bear in mind, you need to gauge this on what you see and what you see happening. You might say one hand pass only. But if you hand pass, the next time you must kick it. You might say, if you kick past the ball to a teammate more than 20 meters away, it's an extra score. Or if you score with your non-dominant leg, I'll give you double points. Do you see now how the game has changed? from the first session to the third one. But more importantly for me as a coach, I will now be able to see the difference between the first game and the last game. The only way you can measure improvement is by repeating something and doing something more than once. So I know, visually, I will know that they're improving because I could see, now, you know, there might not be a massive improvement, but I'd be able to see. I bet you they'll be all moving. They might be, you know, they might be kicking and trying to kick off both sides of the body. They might be, you know, they might. So you'll, you'll see it, trust me. But did I know they're improving because I'm going to ask the players for their feedback? Tell me, what did you learn today? Tell me, what do we need to improve this? Describe to me, what do we do today? Explain to me, what must we do here before we go back to the game? 
you're getting players talking in smaller groups, discussing, problem solving. And as a coach, you are now observing the players improving and developing. But you're maximizing the learning by small sided games, regular interventions, but also doing the game more than once. So think about your own sessions. Do you go from one activity to the other? Oh, my next drill is here, I must go on to that. But the point I'm making is, how do you know your activity is having an impact? How do you know it's improving the players? So I would say less is more in your sessions. I would put, I'd rather have two really good small side games or three rather than 10 things. I would have, you know, keep it really simple and really specific to what you're trying to achieve. So before I show you a few other games, I tell me what you think. Tell me what your thoughts so far. I, there's one or two comments came in. I'll just read them here. For younger players' teams, could you get them to solo out to the outside cones? 100%, uh, Ali. You could do whatever you feel is right for your group. You can apply the, the rules that will challenge them 100%. So that's your creativity as a coach. You can apply the various scenarios based on what you see and the stage of development they're on and how they are improving, okay? So, yeah, no bar at all. With small-sided games, is there specific games that is good to promote conference and so-called weaker players? But would it be overshadowed by more development players? We would have a small number with very different levels of ability. So, Seamus, we actually did... A, <laughs> I know you're going to start laughing. We actually did a, a specific webinar on that. How to cater for players with different ability levels in a session. Give a look at it. It's on the LGFA YouTube channel. I know you're laughing away. We have 53 webinars, and one was on how to cater for players of various ability levels in a session. Um, so what I would do there, Seamus, I'd be very clever. Obviously, the, the small side games are going to develop the so-called, I suppose, um, you know, weaker players. So you might mix and match some night. You might, but I would do if I'm mixing and matching, then I probably give different conditions to players. So I might say to the so-called stronger players, you're working off your dominant leg, and I might say to the so-called weaker players, you can work off your your right leg. I might say to the dom the stronger players, you only have one hop on solo. Or I might say to the, the not so strong players, you know, you can hop and so you can you can hop and solo as many times as you want. So that's how I'd work. Or another night, I might put similar ability together in a small side game scenario. I suppose the point I'm making is, as uh, Seamus, is that small side games will develop everyone. I've seen it myself as a coach in my club. I've seen players come from seven years ago who are under seven eights, and they're unbelievable players now. Because of the approach of continually 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, 4v4s. What we actually did, Seamus, was we felt the games program in the county was, okay, it was sufficient. It was working with us. But we felt that we want to contact, we want, we want more football for the players who weren't touching the ball in games. So what we did, Seamus, was we can contact it, two or three other clubs, okay, around, we asked them that, you know what, you know the players in your teams, they're not getting many touches. Can we get together once a month, the three clubs, and we play five, six, seven aside games? And by God, it was the best initiative we ever did. So the point I'm making is, small side games will develop the so-called weaker players. And I think we need to think differently around that in terms of what we're doing as clubs as well. But give a look at that webinar. How to care for players with various ability levels. I think you get a lot of good stuff there, uh, Shame. So I hope that helps. Okay. Um, before I move on. The game will be forward scoring dominant. It's always in scoring range. How do you reward and encourage the other players to really get players to work on both sides of the position? Want defenders to hassle forwards and make sure... Uh, like I said, every forward, every forward can be a defender and every defender can be a forward. So I suppose we just have to be very conscious of that. But what you could do in those games, uh, John, is that if they do, a, uh, you can bring in a rule of the separate model that if you do a really good near hand tackle, then you get an extra point to your team. So now you're rewarding other aspects um, of your game in, in that game as well. Okay, so you can just, again, apply a rule that that is in line with what you're trying to achieve is what I'm saying, John. But I would just be conscious of applying too many rules and focus on too many items in a game. In too many, because what will happen is that there'll be mixed messaging going on. So I would say is, if you are playing a small-sided game, have a real clear focus 
Yes, you can work on other aspects that you might have worked on other games and maybe you want to remind them, you're like, guys, if you do a good tattle, I'll give you, I'll give you an extra five points. Yeah, but we're really focused on the kicking here. So I would say just keep your focus really specific. Um, but you can bring other rules in that if you want to work on other areas, why not? 100%. Um, award, a high, yeah, exactly. If you get a high catch on the other side, reward for high catching. That's another example. Really, really good. Excellent. Excellent. How do you stop two players past each other? Apply a rule, you know, that, okay, if you get a ball, you can't give it back to the player. You're giving it to, okay, or if you get a ball, you need to move into a different space or a zone. So the rule you're applying, Denise, is going to really work on that. But that goes back to your planning. You have to think about it. In a game situation, I, I would be worried if I see two players constantly dominating the game. And I didn't question what's going on in training because there's going to come a time when those players, they may be strong now, but when they come up against a team that are the same physically, shall I say, or aerobically fit, then they're going to, then you're going to probably struggle because the other players haven't been developed enough. Also, what I would say there is those two players, they're always going to get the opposition that's going to say, okay, mark those two girls. You just mark those two girls. So what I would say is in your sessions, it's vitally important that you get rid of those habits. So if you are playing small side games, you need to come up with ways and ideas and rules to ensure that, you know, the bigger picture is always looked at. So give the ball to Mary and Sheila all the time. That will only get you so far, everyone. So it's vitally important that we as coaches are developing everyone and never dismiss anybody. Because a player might be not so good now, but when she goes through her growth spurt, or maybe when she gets developed or whatever, she works on her skills, she could be a totally different player in three or four years' time. And I've actually seen that as well, guys. So don't dismiss anybody. So our coaching environment is vitally important that we are developing everybody in what we're doing. Okay? But the more footballs you have, the more small side games you have. And I would say there is max, mix and match. Even I would say I have those two girls marking each other in training. I'd have them marking each other. So let them have a challenge themselves and their work with the other girls in. So that's be a little kind of idea I would do there. Uh, I don't know if that helps these. Um, it might help you. Okay. So I'm just going to show you a few other games. Give a look at them. These are just a few other options. I'll just throw them out there. I have a bit of time, so I'll throw them out to you that we use, utilize. They're from the Get a Teens program, but sure, look, you can give a look at them and see what you think. So here's a game, guys. Um, it's called... I think which game is this now? Let's just see here. So if you watch this game here, there's four goals. And to maximize participation in learning, when you score, so you have to get uh, the black bibs must get the ball to the girls, the black bibs, the orange bibs must get the ball to the girls, the orange bibs. But in order to in, in maximize participation, if you score, you give the ball to the opposition. So now everybody's involved. But here's a nice small side game that I use regularly. This is indoor. You could use it outdoor. Think about your stepper model. Could be larger space. But look at it here, guys. You could do it here where you can swap the goalkeepers. But here, at all times, it's 4v4. So it's 4v4. Look, girls are past the ball. You can bring in a rule. Every player must touch the ball before you can score. There's so many things. You must kick the ball. You can bring in a bigger space. So there's so many ideas you could do. It's a game I do an awful lot myself. Uh, it's a really, really good game. Uh, so it's the four goal game, really promotes spatial awareness, uh, really gets players to work off both sides in terms of using the full area. So it's a nice game that I use. So I just play it there and I'll show you another one. If you want to share your thoughts on it, more than welcome to. Yeah, this is you know, it's a really good game. Yeah, put them on the same team, 100% I agree. So I'm going to show you another one. So the next game is this one. Okay, so just put on that, what you call it. Okay, watch this game. Now, this is a two-ball game. So when you're observing this game, there's two teams. Remember I said about the, the, the central goal game, about one ball. But if you threw, threw in two balls, this is similar. Only I've done this in a square area. So I actually have no cones out. I just said use the whole area. So two balls, two teams. Watch it again. It's 5v5 with two balls. Interesting. Let's see how it goes. So two balls here. Like really good game. What you notice here is a lot of players, guys, a lot of players will um, 
will go towards the ball. So they'll be very much ball watching. So they'll go to the ball that um that they're involved with. Sorry, I'll push on here. Uh, here we go. Yeah, I let it play here again. So what will happen here is one player will pass the ball and she just follow the ball and she forgets about the other ball. So again, a rule you bring in is when you pass the ball, you must go and go and, and help your teammate on the other ball. It's a really, really good game. It's really actually tough from a physical point of view. Oh my God. Because you have to make hard runs. You have to support your, your partner or she's going to be isolated. But also it's really good for spatial awareness. So the two balls, and I would use two balls an awful lot in games just to I get players to under uh, to observe that. So that's another game. So let's another let's watch another one. So here is a three zone game. Okay, everyone. So in this game, there's three zones. Love this game. Really works on, I suppose, the physical aspect, aspect. But there's three zones. So here again, it's 5v5. But in order to win the game, you must conquer all the three grids. So you could reply here. You could have, you must have two or three hand passes in a grid before you can conquer another grid. Now, if the game, if a team dispossesses a team, then they can go to whatever grid they want, okay? And they must, you know, trying to get those three or four passes to conquer that grid. They must conquer all three to win. So if you get to be dispossessed and you've conquered two, you must try and get to the grid you haven't conquered to win the game. So it's a really good small side game. Um, really good one. Excellent game. Uh, and we, in big spaces, even better again. So it really promotes you know, spatial awareness, using the full space, and actually it really promotes kicking because after a while, the girls get tired because there's only so much hand passing you can do and running around in small areas. The more you can use space and use the kick pass will really help with this game. So I'll just play it there again. So there it is, three zones, 5v5, Really tough. You could say every player must touch the ball on the grid before you move to another ground. And can you imagine how big you can make this as well? Okay. So just another game I wanted to show you before I, before I move on. Okay. I think I have another one or two. Uh, this one here, guys, is, again, the four-goal game, but it outside. So watch the different dynamics. So I showed you indoor, but look at the different dynamic of the game. Now, there's too many players here. As far as I'm concerned, if I was to do that again, I'd have three groups of five, five observing, uh, or four observing, four v four inside. But look at the difference in this game because it's outside. And look because of the space. They're kicking the ball more. Watch. See? Because they know by hand passing and hand passing, it's a lot more difficult. But if we kick the ball more, it's going to be a lot more easier. So look at the different dynamic of the game from indoors to outdoors. And look at the use of the kick pass as a result. So that's the four goal game in an outdoor scenario but look they're more inclined to kick the ball as a result okay so hopefully that'll give you a, another game there okay we we'll move to the next one now this one is you could use for goalkeepers now it's the game here is probably kind of doesn't really show in his real light but I would have a goal at four goals in the center I use four cones you can have a goalkeeper in the center now they can in this game they can only shoot for a goal outside the circle. Okay, now they are shooting in, in inside the circle here. And the ball can go in here. But watch this game. It's good to have the goalkeeper in the center. If you have two goalkeepers, it's really good as well. So it really works on their reflexes and I suppose working, but also works on a small side game to work on team play and also, I suppose, utilizing, uh, maximizing space. So I'll play it here. Now, as you see, everyone, they're inside the, the circle kicking it. But the idea is, look at the goalkeeper in the center. She's waiting. She's waiting. She's four goals. Look at the four goals. She's four sides to... So they're going to kick. She saves it. Okay, goes back out. Now she shouldn't... That's not a score because she kicked from inside. Now she goes over to the far side. She saves it. So it's a nice game where you could utilize your goalkeeper and work on reflexes and also working on your general, I suppose, spatial awareness and whatever skills you want to work on. So everyone, um, just going to go back here. I'm just going to go to chat. Is there anything you like that? I'll just go in here, guys. The Greek game. I like that game. Yeah, they're, they're good games, guys. Um, is there no goals in the second game? I don't have goals. But if you've got small side goals, you can put in the small side goals as goals. 
Like if you've got the equipment, use it. I just use cones there. But if you've got goals, you could use them as goals. You could actually have four goals, uh, small side goals uh, as targets. So yeah, and it doesn't, there's loads of ways you can do it. You can use different color balls. Actually, that's a nice idea. I like it. Whereby you could have two balls, two different colors, and therefore then it really distinguishes with what ball you, you know, you've, you've had and what ball you need to go to. I like that idea. Are you actively coaching or encouraging during games? So the point I'm, I'm saying there is, I would say at the start, going back, Philip, to your original, I would say you're observing, you're looking. You're giving instruction about the game. You're observing. As you move along, Philip, you'll notice that you will probably get more active in your coaching using buzzwords. So, for example, pass and move, hook kick over the bar, keep your eye on the ball, follow through, pass after moving. Do you know that sort of stuff, Philip? So you're using more buzzwords. So as you go through the games, you'll find yourself getting a small bit more vocal because you're re-emphasizing the key points that you want to get across. But you're hoping that the girls are learning as they go along, are giving you that feedback, and then you're reinforcing, you're reinforcing those, shall I, learning moments through buzzwords as you go along. But try and stay outside and not be in the middle of the game and try not to be too vocal because if you're too vocal, then you're probably guiding too much and also you're probably missing what's actually happening in the games. So everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, what did you take from tonight? Uh, it, you know, I hope you took something from it. I hope it gave you a few ideas. I suppose the main point for me is using small-sided games in your sessions are really, really beneficial. It really maximizes learning and also enjoyment and participation and interaction because of smaller numbers. And what we've known from our research, girls will interact and engage a lot better in smaller groups than in larger groups. Okay, so the more we use small side games in our activities, the better it will. Um, okay. So on that note, I want to say thank you very much, everyone. I will go through the the chat. If there's any questions that I haven't answered, I, I I'll actually get onto you directly myself tomorrow, and I and I'll give you a few thoughts and ideas. And um, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. We'll see you back. We have one more webinar. I think it's focused on how to be how to manage game day, how to manage on a game day, which is a really interesting one. How to manage on a game day. Hopefully, we'll see you there. But on that note, I want to say thank you very much, everyone for your interaction, your engagement tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. All the webinars are on the LGFA YouTube channel. They're all there to view uh, at, in your own time. Please share with your fellow colleagues. Have a good evening. Best look at your coaching and good night.